we have probably looked at something like five and a half thousand companies in the space of four or four and a half years. We've invested in 30. Listening, really listening to what somebody is saying to you is the most important thing you can do. That's actually probably the number one lesson. Welcome back to The Change Officer, a mind-opening show where we introduce you to the brilliant humans who are shaping the business landscape of the Middle East. Today with me is a man with over 20 years of experience in corporate law. He has been recognized as one of the MENA Super 50 lawyers by the Asian legal business. This doesn't come as a surprise, considering that he leads the largest team of corporate lawyers in the Middle East, which has advised on several multi-billion dollar cross-border M&A transactions across the region, including deals in real estate, telecommunications, financial institutions, and many other industries. What's more, he is also an expert in tech investing. So he serves as a co-founder and the chairman at the region's number one micro VC Dubai Angel Investors. My guest today, head of corporate at Alta Mimi and the co-founder and chairman of Dubai Angel Investors, Mr. Abdallah Mutavi. Welcome to the change officer, Abdallah. Hey, Vuk. Good to meet you. Good to, good, be here. Good to have you here. We have an awesome conversation as the introduction. And I remember we started our conversation by me telling you how did I come up with the idea to, to invite you to the show? And uh, I'm going to use it to introduce this episode as well. How everything started, and it was Jitex this year. After a very tough uh, 2020, we all got together on Jitex. And I was passing by that stand where you were talking to Roberto from Microsoft. And I was just walking, walking by, and I heard you uh, say, if I had $50 million to distribute in the region, it would be a difficult job. And I was like, wow. I need to stop and hear this out, <laughs> and that's how I that's how I reached, and then 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 our friendship started, and now here we are at, uh, at the Change Officer Podcast. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. So, um, if we stick to that, uh, uh, what you said, if you had fifty million dollars, it would be a difficult job and a challenge job to distribute that funds in uh, in 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 the Middle East or in UAE. Can you unpack that for us a bit more? For sure. So. Uh, well, look, I mean, let's add some context to it, right? Yeah. So we're at Jitex, we're talking with Roberto from Microsoft. It's about funding technology companies, early stage funding, which is an area that I have a particular interest in. I mean, if I had $50 million to distribute into infrastructure businesses or hospitals or schools, it wouldn't be very difficult. Mm. But we're talking specifically about tech companies. So uh, the venture capital world uh, is divided up into people who do really early stage investments, you know, seed rounds and series A rounds, mm -hmm. when a company is just beginning to get off the ground, or the more advanced stage rounds after a company has developed a product, launched it, is commercializing it, and now needs capital to kind of grow and acquire customers. Um, and I guess just to sort of unpack my uh, that uh, what I said that day, if I was investing in more mature companies, mm. it probably wouldn't be too difficult to spend $50 million in the region. My personal interest happens to be in companies at the earlier stage. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I'm talking about sort of checks of say, 250,000 to a million or maybe a couple of million dollars. That's a lot of startups. That's a lot of startups. <laughs> and it would take a long time to kind of find deals that I would regard as being good deals and founders that I would really want to back. Yeah, you, you need a volume. Um, is, there a, is there a statistic which says on how many uh, ideas that you receive, you actually go forward and invest? Yeah, so look, I mean, in my experience um, of being part of the Dubai Angel Investors Group, we have probably looked at something like five to five and a half thousand companies wow. in the space of four, four and a half years. Hmm. We've invested in 30 wow. out of 5,000. So on a typical monthly basis, and I hope the math stacks up here, it probably will. On a typical monthly basis, we get about 100 applications for funding. Mm -hmm. We have a full-time uh, manager, investment manager, who looks at all of the applications, works out which of the companies kind of fit our criteria, and usually creates a long list every month of somewhere between 10 and 12 companies out of 100. So automatically, 90% are falling away just because they don't fit with, with our strategy. 
And then uh, the, the 10 or 12 companies that get shortlisted every month get put into a, a blind voting system. We upload them all online for our investment committee to read. So they read them, they decide which ones they really like, and then they vote mm. using an electronic blind voting system so nobody can see how the others are voting. And only companies that score 70% approval and above actually qualify to come and pitch. Mm. So that reduces from 100 to 10 to, to three, no more than three every month. And then out of every three that we see, we probably invest in half, so, or maybe one. So it's unusual that we would invest in more than one in five, one in six companies that actually comes mm. to pitch. I see. Yeah. So that sounds like a very mature process that you have developed. Um, let's go a couple of steps back. Uh, it's, a, it's a very inspiring and interesting story how you guys got together in the first place. Um, can you just share with us like how, how did it all start? Yeah, I mean, I love telling this story because it's, you know, it's one of the best experiences I've had in my life, actually. So a very close friend of mine uh, who is a professional advisor, a strategy consultant who I've known for many, many years now. We've worked on a lot of deals together in the region. Uh, we've traveled together. We've been in hotels and negotiations. Uh, he called me one day and said, listen, I'm putting together a small group of people. We're going to go out for dinner. We're going to go to Zuma uh, in DIFC. We're going to have a chat. So I, anything he invites me to, I go. So I, I went and he introduced me to these other people. Some of them we knew each other, some we'd never met. Really impressive group of people um, and everybody interested in, you know, founders and, and, uh, and founders of technology startups. So we basically uh, discovered that we share this mutual interest that as individuals we've invested as angel investors. And we thought, you know what, and somebody suggested it, what we should do is we should meet once a month mm -hmm. and any company that we meet during that preceding month, we invite them to come and pitch to us. And then, you know, we have 10 of us or 12 of us sitting around the table. We can put our money together. We can put our brains together. We can do like a more collective uh, exercise of, you know, assessing whether it's a good company to invest in or not. And that way we can kind of take a little bit of shared risk and responsibility, which, which was a very appealing idea. So we did that. We decided there and then it's going to be the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. That was decided there and then. So for the next four or five months on the second Tuesday of every month, we would meet. There mm -hmm. would be this group of 10, 12. Then we started inviting a friend here, a friend there. It became 20, 23, 24 people. After four or five months or six months, we had about 40 individuals who wow. had attended one of these events, who was really interested and who all were saying, guys, let's do something with this. You know, let's, let's set this up as a, as a formal thing. So being the only lawyer in the room, I said to them, yeah, we can do that. You know, there are two or three different ways of doing it. Um, we were not interested in setting it up as a commercial concern where any of us would earn any money from it other than you know, if we're putting, say, $100,000 together, we split that among however many of us there are, and then we pull that together, we do everything we can to try and help that company, and hopefully we're able to sell those shares mm -hmm. sometime down the line. But none of us is going to earn a fee from anybody else for mm -hmm. doing that. So that was the, the sort of fundamental initial philosophy. So we formed a company and uh, we capitalized it. We had 40 investors, some of them bought one share, some of them bought two shares. So we started out with quite a lot of money and a group of uh, 12 investment committee members who we selected, uh, five board members, 12 investment committee members. And the whole process is that, you know, in the second Tuesday of every month, any companies that we find would come and pitch to us and we would have an investment committee that would sit and listen, ask questions, dig deep, and all of us would be invited to that conversation. All of us would be able to participate in that mm. conversation. So it just every month uh, people would turn up. Every month the conversation was like really inspiring, really interesting, really informative. All of us were learning from each other too, right? So, you know, we had a strategy guy, we had an accounting guy, we had an auditor, we had a bunch of tech guys. We How did you pick the, the, the people who were joining? So the initial 12 were contacts of uh, mainly of, mm. of, of this guy who invited us all. Um, 
and they all had different backgrounds. Some of them come from the digital media world. Some of them came from Google. We had a couple of people from Google with, you know, engineering degrees from good American universities. Uh, We had people who had already been venture capital investors before. It was a whole diverse range of people. So the skills around the table were, you know, diverse and interesting. And in my day job, Mm. I was representing both companies and funds Mm. on venture capital investments. Anyway, so I kind of had that legal perspective. So everybody brought something valuable to the table. And these meetings on the second Tuesday of every month just ended up being like super cool evenings. And so then, of course, you know, six, seven months in, of course, this is pre-corona, we would go for a drink afterwards and we'd go to one of the hotels and we'd, you know, grab some beers or whatever. And we started getting to know each other. So this group of people, all of whom maybe were connected to one or two other people in the group, became connected together. And it was a group of 40. Um, And it became a community and it became a group of people. I I would count them all now as being very, very good friends. And that's amazing. You know, I had only been in Dubai for three or four years when this happened. I didn't have that many friends here. You know, a few people. I work very, very hard, long hours. All of a sudden, there's this group of like 40 people and I look at all of them. They're senior members of the business community. They're super bright, super intelligent people. They come from all over the world. And uh, it's a community and it's just grown from there. And we've now taken it. We took it from 40 to uh, 70. Then we added two institutional investors. Then we added more individuals. Now we have more than 100 individuals and a couple of institutions. So um, it sounds like a one one of a kind for the region, right? The, very the, 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 the group, there, there isn't anything similar to, to, to what you guys have. If, and you are not to be compared with any VCs. You're structured differently. Your focus is different, right? The, 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 the strategy is different. Um, what do you think is your USP? So, look, I mean, I, I, just to go back on what you just said, I mm. think the strategy is not that dissimilar to other VCs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the USP is different. The USP is, the, is this network of people. Mm-hmm. So this community that we've built up that is bound by a mutual passion and a group of like-minded people. There's no, beyond how our individual check is going to grow through our investments, there's no other vested interest. So I'm not making money off of him. She's not making money off of me. We're all doing this together. And that, that philosophy is really the fundamental underpinning of this. Mm. We get together on the second Tuesday every month because we like each other and because we all share a similar outlook on what we'd like this journey to look like. And so anyway, that, that, that I guess, uh, is, uh, is what brings us together. And the USP is that when you have these hundred people that are really interested in the companies we invest in, it actually delivers a network effect to mm. the companies that we invest in that very other few other people can match. Mm. So if one of our companies needs to access, you know, um, a enterprise size company for its uh, distribution of its product or to reach a certain individual in the market or to acquire a data set for a machine learning algorithm from a particular type of business, the chances are within our network, we can unlock that type of value. Mm. And we frequently do. So, how do you, yeah. how do you c- handle the conflict of interest that, that sometimes, I guess, appears, right? Shows up. What do you mean? So th- there is a company that, that you invested and then obviously there is a huge value in leveraging 100 people who are you know, working for some of the probably biggest and, and leading companies around the, around the market. Um, and obviously they are direct investors in, into the company. It's not that easy to just introduce them to, right, and, and, and make a deal with them. Yeah, it's true. So, I mean, the way that we, I mean, leverage those relationships is done on an arm's length and mm. an unconflicted way. I mean, mm. we have a very strict conflict of interest policy, I'm sure, I'm sure you, took, you. I'm sure you took care of that. <laughs> I did, I did. I drafted a six-page conflict of interest policy, which is, it's important to have it. You're absolutely right. right. But if any member of our network, for example, wants to introduce one of our companies to an organization that he or she is connected mm-hmm. with, you know, obviously it's up to that individual to make sure that they don't put themselves in a conflict of interest position. But what that usually means is, you know, the person who is in our network will access somebody who's in their network and say, look, take a look at this business, have a coffee with this person. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, I'm not going to interfere. I'm not going to put pressure on you to buy services or engage. 
but just have a look at it because it could be really interesting mm. for us. And then sometimes those conversations go somewhere, sometimes they don't. Mm. But we, we, we do tend to pick quite good companies that happily and easily sell <laughs> themselves, actually. No, it sounds like an absolute dream come true for a, for a, for a company that is just starting. Um, so you get funds that are always, you know, important. Uh, but more importantly, you get access to a network of very diverse group of people who can support you. And they naturally, they want to support you if they invested already in you to support you, you know, across the portfolio of, of different areas and then, you know, services and advisors and so on. So there must be a line of startups knocking at your door. Uh, yeah, I daily, mean, monthly, yearly. There is, there is. <laughs> and it's so, I mean, it's so amazing to see and every month. I still kind of can't believe uh, how lucky we've been and how fortunate we've been to, to create that brand around mm. ourselves and, and to attract that kind of interest. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people are coming to us now and saying, you know, we, we don't just want money. We want your money. Which is more, is more important, right? Absolutely. I, I think m m money, okay, it's not easy to raise funds, but it's a process. If you have something solid, it's it's... Money is one thing, but people, that second part of investment is a more, more important piece. For sure. Especially in the early stage. Later on down the road, I guess when you're a mature startup, you're looking for series B, C, D. Yeah. You're already established. You have a group of people. You, you have experts on board. You need capital just to, 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 as a fuel. But very early stage, in early days, like this type of advisory is probably more important than funds. Definitely. Um, what's your currently uh, focus uh, when it comes to investments? How do you pick your uh, pick the companies that you invest in? Yeah. So look, I mean, I should clarify. By the way, I'm a I'm a board member. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't work with this company full time. I have a I have a job and and so on. But I mean, I can tell you the process and and what we're interested in strategically. I mean, we've invested in companies across a whole range of um, sectors from health tech, education technology, fintech, um, food tech, logistics, um, even workflow process management for digital platforms. There's a whole range of companies that we've invested in. What we're interested in at its heart is a team of individuals who have identified a real problem that can be solved with technology. Mm -hmm in a way that can attract customers, keep those customers, and ultimately monetize the product and, and commercialize um, at scale. So I guess that's probably the most succinct way to describe what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, we're pretty agnostic on geography. We're pretty agnostic on business model. We're pretty agnostic on vertical. Mm -hmm. Really for me uh, personally, and I think I share this with a lot of the people that are involved in the group, I think we're interested in the story of the individual and whether or not that has brought the individual to a point where they can convince us that they are the right person to solve that problem and build that product and commercialize that product. Mm. So, you know, people who come to you with an idea by itself, it's never enough. Mm -hmm the ability to actually take that idea all the way through execution is extremely important. But even then, you know, you're looking for the person who is going to be able to execute and ultimately deliver a really good exit for you as well. Mm. And that's a very particular type of person. So really what we're looking for is, 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 is people. So um, it's interesting to, to dive into this whole topic. Um, there's a book outliers i'm sure you i'm sure you read it um and usually there is always a pattern that you can find behind you know things that are happening in 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 the world there is also a pattern behind successful entrepreneurs pattern behind billionaires pattern behind you know all of the silicon valley guys that throw their books now and so on um if you w w is there anything in common um uh, in successful middle eastern not Middle Eastern, uh, people living in the Middle East, uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, what is, is there anything in common for the ones that you recognize as, you know, successful ones that you invest in? So that's a really good question. Look, I mean, 
it's funny because in my career as a lawyer, um, one of the positions that being a lawyer puts you in, in the same way that it would be if you were, say, a consultant, mm. is that over a period of years, in my case, 25 years now, you're regularly seeing people who either need you to get them out of a problem or help them so that they don't get into a problem. That's basically what we do for a living as lawyers. And so over these 25 years for me, and I remember saying this at 15 years and at 10 years too, but at 25 years, it's really very rich data. Because if you're an entrepreneur or the CEO of a business, the chances are you've been an entrepreneur once, two, three, four, maybe five times. If you're a CEO, the chances are you've been a CEO once, twice, maybe three times. You don't see things the way that people like me see things, whether mm. it's, as I said, lawyers or consultants or others. We see management teams all the time who either need to get out of a problem or avoid getting into one. And in that period of time, what you start to see is that there are intangible qualities to people mm. that make them superstars as managers uh, 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 or as the custodians of a business. Because a business is not just the product and the sales process. It's the people that run the business. It's whether or not you can keep them motivated and feeling good about themselves and feeling good about the product and connecting emotionally with the product and connecting emotionally with the management and the workplace mm -hmm. and the whole you know ethos of the place that they work. And so the superstars distinguish themselves through fairly intangible qualities, in my view. You know, you could distill it down and call it X factor. Mm -hmm. So what I love to look out for is I look, love to look out for people who have X factor. And so I don't know whether you're going to ask me what does that involve or what, what is X factor? Well, I wanted to ask you that, yeah, uh, uh, intangible, I understand. Um, can it be described? Or it's more of some or of a feeling that you get or a gut feeling that you receive or, 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 or there is that thing in their eyes that you see that you recognize you see, okay, this is the one. Yeah. So and look, you're never always going to be right. But again, I can only tell you about my own personal mm. experience. I've always been fascinated with human stories always since I was a kid. Um, and I love people's stories. I love to find out what brought them to this moment here? What is it that kind of got them to get to where they got to and all the things that inform that? I think that every human being is a product of every single experience they've had, every experience they've had up until the moment that you are observing them. And so for me, yes, it is a feeling. Definitely it's a feeling. Um, but I think the qualities probably are very much to do with connection, empathy, compassion, I mean, these are very unusual qualities mm. that people might not associate necessarily with entrepreneurs. But the reason I find that they're really important qualities is that, you know, your ability to connect with an audience or a target market or identify a gap usually comes from your ability to identify with other people. Because if you want to solve a problem, you have to spot the problem. And if you want mm. to spot the problem, you have to watch other people experiencing that problem in order to really understand whether it's a real problem or not. So for me, it all comes down to that really human quality of emotional intelligence, which comes from the ability to connect mm. with the world around you and primarily with people around you, but with the world around you in general. Mm. No, that's true. And, and I remember when we spoke uh, in our introduction meeting that I, I always say, like, maybe it's better if I just publish the introduction meeting that, that I have with, with my guests, because we say all of the, the, the juicy stuff, you know, and all of the good stories. And we talked about this and you said, there is always a story behind the individual that you see, and you need to be patient to hear it out. Now, if there is a startup pitching their idea to you, elevator pitch, but on the other side, you know that you need to give them a chance at the same time. You know, maybe after a couple of iteration, they'll be able to, to kind of transfer the, the idea and to pitch it right. How do you balance between the two, you know, making quick decisions and actually being patient to, to actually meet someone? It's a good question. So look, I mean, we try and at the very early stage, filter out all the ones that we are unlikely to believe in. Mm -hmm. And like I said, that normally is 90% in one go and that 90% is always going to contain four or five or 10 people 
that probably could have really made it, but they just blew the opportunity mm. in the first impression. And that's a shame. And of course, as an investor, you're always going to regret those ones, although there's nothing you can do mm. about it. That's, you know, that's, that's part of the process. Then when you actually get people in front of you, um, it is interesting. I mean, you do observe over time that sometimes you can be sucked in by somebody who is emotionally intelligent and as a result of their emotional intelligence being extremely good at selling. Mm -hmm. And they're selling you something mm -hmm. rather than telling you a story. And it takes a lot of experience and a lot of practice to sort of graduate yes. <laughs> and be able to tell the difference sometimes. Yeah. You know, I mean, sometimes people can be really, really good at it. Um, like I said, for, for me personally, I mean, when we, when we did our uh, initial conversation, it, it really, um, I love to focus very much on the human being presenting that story, presenting themselves, presenting their idea. Occasionally they're going to falter and people can be very unforgiving mm. at that. Um, but, you know, I feel like you have to give them a little bit of a chance. They do have to tick a lot of boxes. They do have to impress you in like, you know, 10, 15 different ways. And for me, if somebody doesn't hit all of those targets at least or at least 80 percent of them mm. then generally speaking i've learned enough now mm. to know that i should probably move on even if there's a chance that i'm letting somebody good go yeah um and you know as i said i mean all all of us have slightly different view of these things and so for dubai angel investors being part of a large group of people that with each one applying his or her own kind of you know view of life uh, it means that we hopefully triangulate and get a good result in the end. Yeah. Um, you've said um, as you were replying to, to one of my questions that you're looking into teams. Um, was there something behind that that you're not looking at individuals or wh what do you prefer, investing in individuals or, or teams? Definitely in teams. And this is a fairly common theme, by the way, mm. for... Um, early stage investors, definitely for venture capital funds. I think they prefer, always prefer teams. Angel investors are slightly more, um, are slightly more on the fence about that. But generally uh, speaking, we do look for teams. Um, you know, I like there to be at least two people on a journey together when they're building a product, solving a problem. Um, creativity is necessary for building technology solutions mm -hmm. and creativity thrives in an environment where people feel good and feel relaxed and have interaction with other people. Um, everybody brings something different to the table. And so in a team environment, there's an opportunity for that to, to, to demonstrate itself. Individuals, and I've seen lots of individuals who have been very successful, by the way. So it's not that an individual cannot be successful. It's just that an, as an investor, I feel that I can't get that comfortable with an individual because the ones who I've seen succeed mm -hmm. tend to be very focused on themselves. Mm. And so I also need the team that is founding a company to be taking care of me as their investor and thinking about me as an investor. When I say me, I mean yeah, yeah, us. Absolutely. And so that's, that's one of the issues that I've always encountered with individuals. Like I said, in my career, I've met many, many individuals who have gone on to become, you know, millionaires, even two or three billionaires, and they're very successful, super sharp, super smart, you know, laser sharp, but very focused on themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I prefer to just avoid that mm -hmm. personality type. Personally. There is a common theme, uh, especially across Silicon Valley, uh, investing in founders rather than startups. And, uh, uh, you know, investing in next Mark Zuckerberg and looking yeah. for a ne next Max, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. Um, and that's a founder and that's an individual. What do you think about it? Well, look, I mean, Silicon Valley is obviously the kind of, <laughs> it's, the, it's the center of gravity for yeah. this. And the thing about Silicon Valley is that there are, you know, now many, many companies that have become not just billion dollar companies, but even trillion dollar companies. And what happens with companies that are at that scale, you know, delivering product and service across the globe, is that they bring people into their environment and make them the very best of whatever mm. it is they do, whether it's in software engineering, whether it's in sales, whether it's in product design and development. So 
people who have been in those organizations frequently are simply superior to anybody who hasn't been in an organization mm. like that when it comes to ideating, developing ideas for other businesses. And so what you tend to find is that in the Silicon Valley environment, or what, what you can see if you look over the last, say, 20, 30 years, is many, many individuals have come out of these big companies, have formed companies of their own, having been equipped by you know, all of the education that they've had in these giants that they've been in. And of course, venture capital investors love to back people like that because you know, they've been sitting at a table with the best of the very best. So once they've done it once and maybe they've exited, uh, then suddenly a founder becomes a very powerful person because mm. somebody who's done it once, exited, delivered great value for an investor, by definition has to possess a whole range of skills that have enabled them to succeed in that way. And so that becomes mm. the gold that they pursue. And it's funny, actually, as a lawyer, I can tell you, you know, there's a anecdotally, I've studied the, the um, evolution of the legal power dynamic or the power dynamic that reflects itself in legal documents between founders and investors in Silicon Valley. And over a period of years, the founder became more and more powerful. Mm. And the, the investor became less and less powerful because there was a lot of money in Silicon Valley chasing, you know, what was perceived to be a very small number of super gold founders. And so, you know, over a period of many years, the founders took control of that power dynamic and started dictating their own terms. Now, in the Middle East, we don't have that. We don't have Silicon Valley. We don't have Netflix and Google and Yahoo and, well, forget about Yahoo, maybe uh, uh, Amazon and Facebook, you know, these the, the giants mm -hmm. that are there, Apple. Um, and so we do not have this gigantic community of engineers and product people and salespeople and, and so on that, you know, have learned in these big institutions. Of course, we have people mm -hmm. that have come from that part of the world who are from here, for example. But there aren't that many of them. So mm. the power dynamic here is a little bit different. And the money is a little bit more dominant when it comes to the power dynamic. What do you think is the secret sauce for, for this region? Um, you said what VCs are after in, in Silicon Valley is, you know, the people who are leaving one of these major corporations, they're coming up with a new startup, they successfully exited already. Here we are relatively young. We've seen some major, you know, exits over the previous couple of years, and we are picking up. And there is more and more startups. And I'm receiving email daily from Magnet, you know, how someone raised another million, or three, or five, or six, and so on. So we're picking up. But what do you think is the secret sauce here for success? So look, I mean, I don't think it's that different to what it is anywhere else. But the Middle East, the Middle Eastern markets, I should say, because mm -hmm. a lot of startups may choose to be based here in the UAE, although increasingly. There, you know, there's a big community growing in Saudi Arabia. There's a big community growing in Egypt as well. Um, but of course, all startups in our region, generally speaking, have to have a multi-country strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, there wouldn't be much point in setting up a tech company that only is going to operate in the UAE because Small it's market, just not yeah. a, a big enough market. So when you look at the Middle East markets, they compare from a tech perspective, from a tech adoption perspective, they compare quite interestingly with other markets around the world. There are some, some dimensions by which you could say the Middle East is, or our markets here are emerging markets. And there are some measures by which you could say they're developed markets. So, you know, if you're looking at GDP in the GCC, it's quite high. It's mm -hmm. actually better than mm -hmm. many of the developed markets. But if you're looking at, say, um, you know, penetration of smartphones or distribution of, uh, you know, wealth across the demographic spectrum, it can be quite different. So there are different types of market segmentation. Uh, people who come from different parts of the world that congregate, it, all sorts of different things go into consumer behavior and the interaction of individuals with technology. So I think the secret source is understanding how to take an idea and a, a, deploy it uh, and develop a product that addresses it within the peculiarities or the specificities mm. of the of the regional environment. Mm. And so actually, if you look at the, the big success stories, in fact, 
they've been set up by companies that have based themselves on Western products and business models, but adapted to the local environment, localization. Um, now, of course, a lot of cynics out there say, well, that's not very interesting. It's cut and paste, copy model. You know what? It's a $3 billion interesting. If it's a $3 billion <laughs> co cut and paste, I'm good with that. And the investors are going to be good with that. But of course, that doesn't mean that we don't, we don't have an ambition to see more of a deep tech community building in our region. That will definitely happen over time. And we've already seen it. I mean, actually, Dubai Angel Investors, the first company we invested in, ended up being acquired by a huge company in the US for a lot of money for developing a real, you know, machine learning, AI based tool here in the Middle East and selling it around the world from here. Wow. And it's, it's actually a company that very few people uh, had heard of because it wasn't a billion dollar exit or $750 million exit, but it was big enough. Um, and there are going to be more of those and we are we are seeing more of them actually. No, I'm sure. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the infrastructure is getting better and it's uh, uh, government is doing a lot to, to support, you know, startups and, um, you know, setting up business now is a lot easier than a couple of years back and so on. So I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot more going on. But to switch gear a bit, um, your actual career is in uh, you're, you've been a lawyer for 25 years. Right. And you've learned a lot. You've met so many people, you know, and, and it's interesting. And I, I share with you the enthusiasm for life stories. You know, how did you become who you are today? You know, how are you sitting now in this chair? Why did I <laughs> invite you <laughs> today? And you started, founded Dubai Angel Investment Fund. Um, what are some of the biggest lessons that you learned over these 25 years being an attorney around the world? Oh, wow. So that's... Uh Okay, no, but the better. What is the most important lesson that you that you learned? The most important lesson that I've learned, I think, um, I think connecting with people is the most valuable thing that you can learn how to do. Um, listening, listening, really listening to what somebody is saying to you, is the most important thing you can do. That's actually probably the number one lesson. For, uh, that, for me, that's the number one lesson for anybody who is seeking to be an advisor or a mentor or a guide uh, is actually listening to what the person in front of you is saying. And I remember the first time I read a book about uh, about effective listening, I just wasn't aware that there are many different types and that, you know, I became conscious that when people were talking to me when I was younger, usually what I was doing was preparing a response in my head to what they were in the process of saying to me, rather than kind of emptying my mind and focusing 100% on the words that were coming out of them. I mean, when I was a kid, my grandfather said to me, listen more, talk less. Mm -hmm. Those were literally four words. He pulled me aside one day. I guess I was talking too much as an eight, nine year old kid. And he just said, always remember, you know, you should be listening twice as much as you should be talking. And then since then, I mean, I keep hearing stories about this. Somebody said, you know, we were given two ears so that we could, you know, listen twice as much as we were talking with, with the one mouth that we've been given. I believe in that. And I think that listening is probably the most important thing I've learned how to do. And it's, it's, and it's funny. I'm really curious to, to, to maybe I'm going to write that book Outliers one day, you know, uh, Outliers version two. Um, and, you know, as, as, as you're growing up and, you know, kids are coming and uh, a lot of parents out there are stressing, you know, you know, should they go to a good school or is the good school a guarantee that, you know, they're going to succeed one day or, you know, but here is one lesson that you received in, in a matter of three seconds that stick to you more than probably a lot of lectures that you receive from, from some professors, you know, yeah. at, at, at the university. You know what, that man, my grand, my mother's father, um, I received so many things from him that happened in a matter of seconds that stick with me to this very day. And I think the reason for that fundamentally is because he was really interested in my development. He always, you know, he was such a busy man. He was a very, su very successful man, actually. But in the moments where he and I were interacting, his focus was really on, on me. And so as a parent, I've tried to apply that. Uh, I hope I've applied it with my kids is be really focused on the people in front of you, really focus on 
what it is that is driving them, what makes them happy, what makes them sad, what drives their passions and interests. Because I think that's how you get um, the most out of people and make people feel good about themselves. And I think when you make people feel good about themselves, that their chances of of delivering on being uh, and being successful are just that much higher. So yeah, I mean, for me, it's a big it's a big part of my you know understanding of of life. Yeah, and and I'm sure you had a chance over the 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 the, the course of your career um, to use that skill tremendously in all of the cases that you've been leading and, and and I'm sure in listening there is a lot of answers that you can get right definitely <laughs> look you know it's a funny <laughs> profession the legal profession uh, <laughs> any of my colleagues who see this are not going to be happy to hear this but you know the majority of lawyers I've met in my life have not been people that I would want to spend a lot of time with socially <laughs> you know to be honest we're sort of we, we, you know we we seem to be um, a type of person who's very, very keen to speak and demonstrate their knowledge and not be listening. Mm. Um, I, I find that, you know, I find that compassion and taking an interest in people's stories is just a fundamental part of being a good, a good person. And, and that's really all I care about. I've been very lucky to have had a good, a good journey in my career. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, whether I'm sitting uh, with a client doing a deal whether I'm sitting across the table from somebody in a negotiation that sometimes can become quite heated. Uh, there have even been times in my career when I've been involved in litigation in court cases or arbitrations. And, uh, you know, you're uh, either preparing your client mm. for a difficult cross-examination or you're preparing to actually, uh, you know, cross-examine a witness or have one of your local counsel do the same. And ultimately, finding ways of you know, reaching a person, reaching into a person is always the way to get what you want from them. Uh, wonderful chat. I, I think we're going to call it uh, off now with this sentence and message that we sent listening. I think this is an underlined two times. It's one of the most important skills that one can can master. Thanks for a great chat. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And I'm, uh, you're, you're, you're a man of inspiration. There is so many things to talk to you about, but I'm going to keep it focused. Uh, I hope that you guys picked up some good um, uh, inspirations and insights uh, and that you enjoyed our chat. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me, Vok. I really appreciate it. It was great. And I hope we can repeat it maybe in a year or so just to reflect on 2021. Why not? <laughs> Thanks for staying until the end. If you enjoy what we're doing with the Change Officer podcast, please like and subscribe. And I'll see you next Monday with another amazing guest. Thank you for staying until the end.